everyone and welcome to Sun Up. I'm Lyndall Stout. We begin today looking at how the first freeze is impacting late maturing summer crops. Here's Sun Up's Dave Deacon and our Extension Cropping System Specialist Josh Lofton. At the beginning of the soybean season we were in a field right over there looking at some really small soybean plants that, that, that didn't look like they were going to take off. We're back out here at Perkins. The crop is up. It looks like it's, it's starting to recede a little bit. Where are we with soybeans right now, Josh? Overall, if we look at a year as a whole, we, we, we probably are in a much better place than we thought we were going to be in April. Mm -hmm. um, most of the information I've gotten, at least uh, from preliminary reports, show that the soybean production throughout the state was really good, mm -hmm. uh, really strong yields where we were able to get them in, get them out. Um, so, so overall, everything that's been harvested thus far looks looks to be uh, pretty good as far as the soybean uh, industry as well as the sorghum is concerned. Earlier just earlier this month we had a had a freeze situation across the state and and that has impacted some of the crops too. Yeah we we, we talk about freeze situations all the time and most of the time they're really late in the season we always talk about you know those November freezes we always even talk about those scary Halloween freezes. Right. We, we rarely talk about the 10th of October freezes. And, right. and that has potentially caused some issues for us this year, especially some of our crops that were, were still had a lot of, lot of time left in them. Uh, we, we look at a, a crop that we have here. This is, this is double crop soybean, really late planted. This actually went in about the middle of July, mm -hmm. looking to see what our potential was if we had, had that window of opportunity. And we, we see that it, it, it really is going to take a hit with the, with the frost. Um, we do see the damage of that. Uh, you can see this browning of these leaves. Uh, this, this has actually had no chemical applied on it as far as the desiccation. This is all environmental stress here. You're talking maybe 10 to 20%, maybe on the verge of 30% yield reduction when we hit, when we're still filling pods. Basically what we've done is have shut down a majority of this plant. Even though it's green, even though it's got a lot of greenness to it and we think that it's still going, um, uh, freezes that are really, really stark, especially growers that got those 20 degree freezes for long periods of time, uh, we've, we've pretty much terminated that plant. And, and even though it doesn't look terminated, more than likely we've seen the growth and the development of those pods uh, has pretty much ceased. There's a little concern for these right here um, as far as what, what kind of yield we're going to make from them. So we have the other end, which is where I think a majority of our soybean producers were at, right. which is at this R6.5. So that's when we filled the pod, we're starting to, to seal off that seed from the plant. That's a good thing mm -hmm. because even at the freezes we have, we're looking for yield losses to be minimal. Right. Uh, we still can get some losses, especially and those growers out west that got down into the 20s, we're talking about five, six, seven hours of, of below 30 degree temperatures. That's going to be a big issue for us. But where we have uh, where we have now is mainly just a dry down issue. And this is where we're at with with some of these. And we see that the even though the pod looks mature, uh, you open it up and the beans look fairly mature. That seed is fairly rubbery. Mm -hmm. um, we, we still got a tremendous amount of moisture in that. You know, probably probably greater than 30 percent moisture still left in that seed so we have a long ways to go as far as dry down so even though the fields might look very brown it might look time for that combine growers need to get out there and actually feel around because it's going to be very difficult to thresh some of these beans that are that are like this uh, especially that had the really high moisture so how far did this freeze set us back i i know that it's going to vary from place to place but 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 if you were to estimate generically how how far back did that freeze push soybeans? Yeah, it's really gonna depend on the growth stage they were at. If we were really close to the end, we, we might have just uh, finished us off and, and really done us in and, and might have quickened us a little bit. Um, those that were just now starting to get mature, we probably set ourselves back 
could have set ourselves back seven to 10 days. Um, and, and really that, that tipping point is gonna depend on, once again, we always talk about temperature of freeze, our freeze, maturity group. When we talk about those freeze conditions, those are our three things that we have to talk about. And where you were on that is gonna de determine, but at, at worst case scenario, we'll probably set back a week. Mm -hmm. um, best case scenario, it might speed us up a little bit to where we can actually get in and get out. So, so whenever it comes to some crops, fight the urge to go out and, and terminate the crop, just go ahead and let nature take its course with some of them. Yeah, and, and that's, the, that's the question we get. And, and unfortunately, that's a, that's a big question mark for us right now. More often than not, it's best to just let mother nature take its course. Be patient, sit on our hands for maybe a week to 10 days and, and really get the good, goodness out of the crop. Okay, thank you very much. Dr. Josh Lofton, cropping systems specialist here at Oklahoma State University. We've had one of those summers across a lot of Oklahoma where we've had adequate moisture and grown a lot of grass and therefore ranchers have put up quite a little bit of hay to feed the cows this winter. Knowing what's in that hay is so very, very important as we uh, develop our strategy as far as winter supplementation of our beef cows that are going to be consuming that hay through the fall and winter months. The quality of the hay can really determine how much supplementation we need to feed. Take a look at this table. What we're looking at here is the amount of a high protein supplement, something that's 40 percent or better in terms of crude protein, how much of that in terms of pounds per day these cows need in order to meet their protein needs. You'll see quite a change in uh, the, the needs depending upon the quality of the hay that those cows are consuming. For instance, if you look at those uh, dry cows here mid-gestation in the fall, uh, early winter months, if they're consuming that real low quality grass hay of only about 4%, they need over a couple of pounds of the supplement to meet their protein needs. Whereas the cow getting the moderate uh, quality hay, 6%, need half as much of that protein supplement to meet their needs and those getting the real high quality hay really can get by on just the hay alone if that makes up the the majority of their diet. Let's drop down and look at what happens after the cow calves and she's in early lactation. Again you see a huge difference in the amount of the protein supplement that they need if they're consuming the real low quality hay it takes 4.7 pounds of that 40 percent supplement to meet the protein needs of that 1100 pound lactating cow as compared to only about one third as much, one and a half pounds of 40% for the cow that's consuming the high quality hay. So I would really suggest that you take time and a little bit of money to have your hay tested. Find out how much protein is in your grass hay uh, this fall so that you can match the protein supplement program up to the quality of the hay. And if you'd like to learn a little bit more about getting hay samples, and getting them tested, what the test means, go to the SUNUP website. That's sunup.okstate.edu. Look under show links and there we'll have a, a link to a, a fact sheet that'll tell you a lot about how to properly sample the hay. Send that sample off and find out how, what's in your hay this fall and this winter. We hope you'll do that. I think it'll help you save some supplement money and get those cows properly fed as they go through this winter. And we look forward to visiting with you again next week on SUNUP's Cow Calf Corner. Well, the cattle and beef markets are looking stronger. So Daryl, is this what we expect about this time of year? Well, it's kind of a mixed bag right now. Uh, you know, we have seen uh, feeder cattle markets get stronger. That's a little bit unseasonal, but it's, you know, there's some, a lot of dynamics in that market right now. Fed cattle markets have been getting stronger, and that's actually a, what, kind of what we expect this time of the year. Box beef markets, uh, you know, really not uh, uh, typically stronger right now. So again, kind of a mixed bag, uh, lots of dynamics in the market right now. So how's wheat pasture condition looking right now? 
You know, the wheat's looking really good around Oklahoma. USDA reported this last week that the crop progress uh, showed about 69% of Oklahoma's wheat is planted. That's pretty close to the five-year average, but uh, about 51% of that wheat is emerged right now, and that's uh, you know ahead of the five-year average of about 42%. So we got the wheat in early. It's looking good. Uh, there seems to be a lot of demand for wheat pasture cattle markets. That's part of the reason those feeder cattle markets have been stronger. And uh, you know, I've heard anecdotally that there's some uh, some cattle already out on wheat in a few places. There'll be a lot more cattle or a lot more wheat ready for cattle here in the next uh, two or three weeks. So fed cattle and boxed beef markets have been, you know, pretty, have been higher. Has that been more for demand or supply? Well, I'm going to say it's a mixture of both, and that's kind of typical, I guess. Uh, you know, on the uh, on the demand side, uh, you know, this time of the year, uh, we typically see the end meats in terms of box beef get a little stronger. It's cooler weather, fall weather, so we're looking at roasts and crockpot cooking, that kind of thing. Uh, but we're also seeing the rib market really start to take off. It typically does as we go in from October into November, as we buy those uh, prime ribs for the holiday season in December and January. So, so that's kind of you know what's going on there. On the supply side, fed cattle uh, supplies are a little bit tighter. Um, so, you know, we're seeing show lists come down a little bit. That's helping support this fed cattle market uh, as we go through the, you know, the, the coming weeks here. Looking outside of the U.S., what did the international trade data show for beef? Well, the last trade data we got was, uh, you know, on the import side, imports were actually down a little bit, a little over 2%. Uh, we're about flat for the year, up just fractionally, uh, and that's pretty consistent. This will be the fourth year in a row where we've seen not much change in total beef imports. On the export side, it's a little more concerning. Uh, August import or exports, excuse me, were down a little over 9%. Uh, we're down 3.8% uh, for the year to date, and that's yeah, again, that's a little disturbing. Three of our five biggest markets were down double digits, so Japan, South Korea, and uh, Mexico were all down. Hong Kong was also down, uh, you know, 4.8%, something like that. Uh, so we're watching that weakness in those markets. Uh, hopefully in Japan, which is our biggest market, uh, the new agreement that we have, uh, at least in principle with Japan, is going to uh, sort of put us back on par with the TPP countries that uh, have been uh, taking market share away from us. So hopefully that's gonna help uh, stop the erosion of that market. All right, thanks, Daryl. Daryl Peel, Livestock Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. We're talking now about the U.S. and China trade war with Larry Sanders, our Extension Ag Policy Specialist and Economist. Larry, it seems like there's something new in the news every day. That's right. You know, two weeks ago, it seemed like uh, the president had a plan that he was going to meet with the Chinese and they were going to sign an agreement to begin to stop the trade war. And if that didn't work, he was going to institute more of these uh, uh, tariffs on the Chinese. And in fact, uh, we did meet with the Chinese about a week ago and uh, the president and his negotiators came out uh, very optimistic on the surface after they came out of the agreement, uh, the United States did agree to not initiate the tariffs they were going to put into place this week. Uh, and so there's probably some talking going on, but they have to be uh, committed to those talks. There's some hope that they will meet. The president and the premier of China will meet at the summit that's going to take place in November in hopes that they will sign the accord there. Do we think that is all going to work out? What's the, what's the latest? Well, there have been some very optimistic activities ha happening. In fact, just as the discussions were taking place, there were from some very large uh, sales made to the Chinese in pork and soybeans. In fact, this has been one of the largest years for sales of U.S. pork to the Chinese. They did make a large purchase of soybeans. Uh, the pork is understandable because African swine fever has hit the Chinese and they're going every, anywhere they can to buy pork because they're a large consumer of pork. And so we're looking like we're going to be able to sell a lot more to them. 
as we boil this down for producers specifically in Oklahoma, what should they keep in mind? What are the, the takeaways as this process continues? They're going to watch and they're going to want to watch and see what progress is made between now and November because if it's not made and there's not a signing of this phase one in November, then all bets are off. The president will initiate the tariffs that he was going to put in this past week and he's going to put in the tariffs that he was going to put in in December and it's going to look like a pretty rocky 19, uh, 2020 uh, with that happening because the Chinese are also going to do tit for tat during that year. Larry, thanks so much for your time and of course keep us updated and we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Hello, Wesley back for the weekly Mesonet weather report. Most locations of the state have experienced their first freezing event of the fall. As of October the 15th, the number of days below freezing are shown in this map. Only 19 of the 120 Mesonet sites have yet to see a freeze. Kenton, in the tip of the panhandle, has already had six. After such a warm September, it was a bit of a surprise for the cold weather to arrive so early. If we look at the long-term average first freeze date, we see just how early it really was. The blue areas of the Northwest and Panhandle saw freezing temperatures only a week or two ahead of schedule, but the yellow and red parts of the state that froze were up to a month ahead of what was expected. Unfortunately, the cooler weather has not brought a lot of rain along with it. The seven-day rainfall map from Wednesday show very little has fallen in the drier parts of western Oklahoma. The soil moisture levels are reflecting this recent lack of rainfall. This map of 4 inch percent plant available water shows lots of reds and yellows indicating dry soils in all of the southwest and most of the Panhandle region. These regions are due a good soaking rain. Now here's Gary with some long term precipitation maps. Thanks Wes and good morning everyone. We've certainly started to dry out over the last 30 days and that's putting us in a little bit more jeopardy for drought to intensify across parts of the state. Let's go take a look at that latest drought monitor map and some rainfall statistics and see what we have. Well, we're still seeing that drought being centered uh, down in southwest Oklahoma. And I'm afraid that's not necessarily the place that we're going to have to be looking at in the future. Now, it's going to have to be watched, but up in the panhandle, we're also starting to see that drought start to encroach down from Kansas. So we have the drought area up in northwest Oklahoma in the Panhandle and also centered down in southwest Oklahoma, but other areas are going to have to be watched. Let's go to the 30-day rainfall maps and see why. Now the rainfall map itself looks pretty good across eastern and north central Oklahoma with those oranges, uh, reds, and yellows. That's uh, rainfall greater than three to four inches. Now some areas have had way too much, but then we see those areas of light green and blue down across parts of central, south central, and the western Panhandle. Um, but, and then we go to the percent of normal map for the last 30 days and we can see on those uh, reds and yellows and oranges that's the area where it's starting to look bad out across the western panhandle where they've had less than 40% of normal rainfall over that 30 day period and we see similar statistics uh, across parts of uh, west central Oklahoma but also central Oklahoma to the south and east of Oklahoma City. And those rainfall deficits don't just uh, begin 30 days ago. We can go all the way back to mid-June, the 120-day rainfall maps, and we can see those deficits start to stand out even more. Now across the Panhandle, West Central, and Southwest Oklahoma, we see those yellow and orange areas indicating rainfall amounts less than eight inches in general. Those are areas that are becoming a problem. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. Last week we saw a 16 cent increase in wheat prices and Kim, are we gonna continue on that trend? Well, there's a possibility that we're gonna get higher prices. Last week, that 16 cent, it popped through that 410 resistance and went up and took out 420. I think 420 was a critical uh, price level to get above. Uh, we've held it so far this week. If we stay above that, I believe we can get up to maybe 430 or 440 on the futures price. That'd be another 010 to 20 cent price increase. But if we pop back down below 420, 
then we could go back down and challenge that $4 low. So there's about a 50-50 chance, maybe a 60% chance it'll go on up and a 40 down. So that's Oklahoma wheat prices. Where are we at with the world crop production overall? Well, the, the news right now is uh, mostly in spring wheat production in northern U.S., uh, Canada, the, and you know, excess rains, freezes, snow, as uh, reducing the quantity and quality of those uh, products. It's going to reduce the protein around the world. Uh, there's still uh, some uncertainty about the Russian crop. Uh, we'll have to see how that comes out. Of course, Australia continued dry, uh, continued losing uh, production there. And then there's rumors, uncertain there, about uh, lower production in Argentina. If we can get this lower production around the world, we could get higher prices. So we really could, but, but what's, what's the likelihood of, of that staying around for a while? Well, right now the, the market's just waiting to see what's going to happen in, uh, in, I believe, the southern hemisphere, I think, northern U.S., Canada, uh, Russia. I think the market's got a relatively good handle on how they are. There could be some surprises there, you know, as, uh, as there has been over the last few years with in increasing Russia's production. I think the market's got a pretty good handle right now. And so uh, we could, you know, the seasonally prices uh, typically go up as you uh, go into the December, January time period. I think uh, that's what we could expect right now. Grain only uh, wheat's going in the ground right now. What, 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 what should producers expect for 2020 production of wheat? Well, if you look at the forward contract uh, right now for uh, 2020 wheat, uh, they can forward contract somewhere around 415, 420 cents a bushel. I think the market is pricing a relatively low uh, protein there and, and uh, having a protein premium. So if you have 12.6 or better protein, I think you're going to get up oh, uh, $485 for your wheat. If you have that low protein wheat, I think you're down around this 420. Okay, thank you very much. Kim Anderson, Grain Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Yoni's disease in beef cattle. Most cattle that are positive for Yoni's are infected at a very young age. Uh, the bacteria that causes this problem is called Mycobacterium avium subspecies paratuberculosis, or we commonly refer to it as MAP, M-A-P. The infection is contagious. It can spread from one animal to the next. It can even spread from cattle to sheep or cattle to goats or sheep to cattle, uh, goats to cattle. Uh, typically, this disease is found in ruminants. Uh, but it has also been found in other species as well. The typical clinical signs that we see with this disease are a diarrhea and a rapid loss of weight. These animals are, it's probably also, a lot of times we could call this a wasting disease. The way we diagnose this disease is one or two ways. One, we look for the organism, the, the bacteria in the fe feces of these infected animals, or two, we test blood and look for an immune response to this disease. There is no treatment for this disease. Once an animal has it, they'll have it for life. The way we try to prevent this disease is one, don't buy the disease. Uh, never uh, purchase an animal without testing them before you introduce them into your herd. Uh, the other things that we try to do is manage manure. We know that the calves are the ones that get infected early on in life so they are having contact with this bacteria and the bacteria will be in the feces material. So we want to make sure the environment that calves are raised in is very clean. The second thing that we want to do is make sure that we try to test our cattle and call out any positive animals to try to get, get try to prevent this bacteria from being spread in the herd. Uh, there's a lot of controversy from this disease on one aspect, and that is, is it a zoonotic disease? And the jury's still out on that. There's information that supports both sides of that argument, but we're gonna have to wait and see uh, for in the future to see whether it is truly a zoonotic disease. Hey, if you'd like some more information about Yoni's disease in, in beef cattle, uh, go to sunup.okstate.edu. Well, much of Oklahoma finally got a break from the heat, but Phil, are we gonna get a break from those pesky insects like mosquitoes and flies? To some extent, uh, anytime it gets below 50 degrees, you get sort of a break from some of the really pest insects like mosquitoes and flies. Insects have a way of avoiding the freeze or avoiding cold weather. 
Well, talk a little bit more about that. How do they avoid, you know, some of the colder well, weather? Well, several different ways. You know, uh, if you think about things like uh, the monarchs, they migrate, you know, so they move further south. Uh, if you think about things like uh, grasshoppers, you know, some of the adults can even live through the winter if it's not too, of a, too much of a severe winter. Uh, but insects have a unique way of sort of super cooling themselves so they can actually tolerate some freezing conditions. And they can re some insects can resist some incredibly cold conditions. And then just seeking out harborage, whether it be in a log, in a home, uh, in leaf litter, wherever the case may be. So they're really good at avoiding cold. So um, like, like moving forward to some of the tree insects that impact stuff like the pecan, uh, the pecan crop, how does the cold weather and you know, the hard freezes or the, you know, or the light frost impact those type of insects? Well, it, it kind of depends on the, on the pest. If it's a foliage feeding pest, yeah, they're probably going to go through either, they're going to be either killed by a hard freeze or they're going to decide it's time to pupate and so they crawl down off the tree, crawl into the leaf litter or under the bark in some cases, like aphids under the bark, and they'll overwinter in that protective environment. If it's something like a pecan weevil, which has at this point exited the nut and entered the soil, they're gonna make a little earthen cell and they'll be protected. And their metabolism slows way, way down. One of the ways that insects um, can sort of get ready for cold weather is they'll they use a form of ant antifreeze. So they'll concentrate this form of antifreeze called glycerol into their system. And that will help them avoid cold temperatures, not bitterly cold, but cold temperatures. But in regards to the, the, the pests that we usually think about that are just you know bothering us during the, summer, the late spring and uh, summer months, like mosquitoes and flies, when, when typically do we start to see those, um, kind, th those populations kind of decrease? Those populations will decrease here once we get that hard freeze. But you gotta remember that flies in particular, not, I mean, mosquitoes are a form of fly, but the flies like house flies and horn flies and things of that nature, particularly house flies and things like stink bugs, they'll look for harborage inside. So they'll use, even ladybug beetles, ladybug, uh, ladybird beetles, they'll use uh, harborage inside. So they'll look for a high point and cluster up and stay together. Things like honeybees, on the other hand, They'll go into their hive and they'll concentrate their hive around the queen and they'll use wing fluttering and they will, they'll move uh, members that are getting too warm to the peripheral of that cluster and then they kind of will change places and, and warm up inside. But the, the big point for honeybees is keep the queen comfortable. All right, thanks, Phil. If you'd like some more information on insects in the cold, go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. That'll do it for us this week. Remember, you can always find us at sunup.okstate.edu and follow us on YouTube and social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone, and remember Oklahoma agriculture starts at sunup. <laughs>